York. Member supported public television. BBC World News is brought to you by WLIW New York. Funding of this presentation has been provided by... In New Jersey, 1 in 10 people currently work in a high-tech sector like biopharmaceutical, telecom, e-commerce, or IT. New Jersey, the innovation garden state where brilliant ideas grow. And by the Freeman Foundation of New York and Stowe, Vermont. And... foreign ministers agree to sanctions targeting Zimbabwe's leaders. The EU's election observer team in Zimbabwe is also being recalled. A defiant Slobodan Milosevic completes his opening statement at the war crimes trial. First pictures of the weekend's devastating attack by Maoist guerrillas in Nepal. And the world's biggest diamond robbery, four men are convicted in London. Hello, this is BBC World News. I'm Adrian Finnegan. European Union foreign ministers have decided to impose sanctions against Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe and his closest advisers. The move follows the expulsion of the head of an EU election observer team on Saturday. The EU will also withdraw the rest of its election monitors sent after allegations of intimidation in the run-up to the presidential elections in March. Meanwhile, the opposition Movement for Democratic Change says several hundred ruling party supporters have stoned its headquarters in the capital, Harare. Decision day finally reached. The participants arrived for today's Brussels discussions knowing that their credibility was at stake. They've tried and tried again to find a way of avoiding sanctions, clinging to slim hopes that if they held back, the election monitors could stay in place and do some good. But now the game is up. After the expulsion of the chief monitor at the weekend, they had to act. Zimbabwe itself, it's not even two years since the last set of dubiously won elections, parliamentary contests held in June 2000. Hopes that things could be different this time have faded now virtually to nothing. These pictures, smuggled out of Zimbabwe today, show the weekend funeral of a 24-year-old opposition activist, murdered, according to his grieving father, while he was out buying medicine for a sick child. Mr Mugabe's supporters, meanwhile, have been showing their strength outside the British High Commission, and their leader has been repeating his view that European attempts to intervene are pure colonialism. Europe should not continue to supervise us because we don't go to their countries to supervise their elections at all. The European reaction to that defiance is so-called smart sanctions. There'll be a travel ban on Mr Mugabe and 19 of his closest associates. All their financial assets still held in the European Union will be frozen. And there'll be a complete ban on arms sales from any EU nation. The message is that we believe he's trying to steal the election, to refuse reasonable conditions for EU observers from 14 member states is outrageous. It shows that his claim to be interested in free and fair elections is entirely bogus. We have made every effort to have these observers in. We have made many, many accommodations to the government of Zimbabwe, but today was the end of the road. But tonight, nobody here is pretending that the end of the road is a happy place to be. It is a failure, and sanctions are not a complete answer. When the Foreign Secretary was asked what effect these sanctions would have on Mr Mugabe, he said they would probably inconvenience him. And the expelled head of the EU's monitoring team said the Zimbabwean leader would just shrug his shoulders. Nobody here is pretending that this action will have huge effect on the ground. But everyone is agreed. It had to be taken. Justin Webb, BBC News, Brussels. Well, earlier, my colleague George Alagaya spoke to the EU's External Affairs Commissioner, Chris Patton, and suggested that the EU is doing just what Mr Mugabe wants in withdrawing election observers from Zimb Zimbabwe. That may well be true. Um, he would have played it even better if we'd been strung along uh, and had agreed to hang around, um, not doing a credible job, but providing a fig leaf for whatever Mr Mugabe is up to. So very, very, very reluctantly... 
uh, we've had to pull out um, our observation team. There are still teams there that we're supporting, for example, the one from southern African countries uh, and local observers, and there are other observers there from Nigeria and the Commonwealth and from Norway. But frankly, uh, we won't pre be pre prepared to be there um, doing an incredible job, I increasingly frustrated and interfered with by Mr Mugabe and his cronies. It's a pity, but there it is. But now the observers have been pulled out, they're not going to be able to do any job at all, are they? Clearly, we wanted to stay if we possibly could, because last time we were there, we think we had an effect in reducing the level of violence. We think uh, our presence encouraged more people to go to the polls. So if we possibly could have done, we'd have stayed. But the circumstances, the arrangements were impossible. No agreement about accreditation of our observers, and no agreement to let people go wherever they wanted, speak to whoever they wanted, no uh, proper arrangements on security. So alas, we've had to pull people out. So do you think there's any chance of these elections being free and fair? Well, I very much hope that the people of Zimbabwe uh, will turn out, that they'll turn out in sufficient numbers so that it's impossible uh, to rig by a few percent here or a few percent there. I very much hope that. I'm also deeply, deeply sad that we're not able to be there uh, with our presence encouraging more to turn out. But frankly, if we'd just fetched up uh, hanging around on Mr Mugabe's terms, we'd have been made a laughing stock and it wouldn't have been any help to the people of Zimbabwe, who we really seriously want to help. Mr Patton, you've just run through a litany of all the things that Mr Mugabe has done wrong. Do you think, therefore, that these elections can be free and fair? Well, it, it seems to me uh, doubtful, given what he's already done about the media, uh, given what he's also done uh, in other areas, given the level of violence, uh, but I very, very much hope that things won't get worse uh, and that enough people will be able to vote and make their opinions felt. So what are you going to do a day or two after these elections? Are you going to accept the verdict of the other teams of observers? Well, we'll have to see ourselves what happens, uh, and we'll have to be making assessment on the basis of, uh, of those various sources of advice and evidence. Uh, but uh, certainly there have been things happening already which have compromised the election process. The EU's External Affairs Commissioner Chris Patton speaking to my colleague George Alagaya. The former Yugoslav president Slobodan Milosevic has finished two and a half days of opening statements at his war crimes trial in The Hague. He said Western leaders had fanned the flames of ethnic hatred within Bosnia and Croatia to start civil wars there. He also accused the Western media of conducting savage attacks against his family. The Hague Tribunal reconvened this morning to hear Slobodan Milosevic conclude his ten-hour-long opening statement. Yes, Mr Milosevic. He portrayed himself as a man of peace who had always tried to prevent bloodshed, while Western countries, by supporting the violent breakup of the former Yugoslavia, had helped to cause it. Referring to the most notorious crime of which he's accused, genocide, in connection with the massacre of 7,000 Muslims at Srebrenica, Mr. Milosevic said he had nothing to do with those events. On the contrary, he had responded to them by saving a brigade of 800 Muslims from further violence. He summed up with a defiant appeal to the public beyond the courtroom walls, who, he said, would be his jury. As you manage to see over these past three days, the truth is on my side. That is why I feel superior here, and that is why I feel to be the moral victor. In the afternoon, the first witness was brought in, Mahmoud Bakali, a Kosovo Albanian politician who described a meeting with Mr. Milosevic in 1998 at which he had described how Serb police had murdered an Albanian family. Milosevic said to me, We gave him two hours to get away, and he talked about terrorism. I said, But these were state police committing crimes. He said, Don't get so carried away. So the battle lines here at the tribunal are drawn, the scene set for many months of testimony from witnesses. Mr Milosevic has made clear that although he describes the tribunal as illegal, he will cooperate with it and intends to use it to establish his innocence. Angus Roxborough, BBC News, in The Hague. The Nepalese parliament has been debating a move to extend the country's state of emergency for a further three months. 
It's aimed at boosting efforts to put down a rebellion by Maoist guerrillas after a devastating weekend attacks in the town of Mangalsen in the Acham region. The attacks killed more than 120 members of the security forces and several civilian officials. Our correspondent Daniel Lack reports now from the capital Kathmandu. The first pictures from the scene of Nepal's worst ever Maoist attack. In the remote far western district of Acham, the main town has been devastated along with the airport. The Maoists haven't struck so successfully or murderously before. That their opponents were from the Royal Nepal Army, only drafted in last November to help the police fight the insurgency, is of deep concern here. The distant town of Mangalsen in Acham was a smoldering shell, one day a district headquarters full of the security forces, the next a mortuary, with dead policemen and soldiers everywhere. Funerals will have taken place by now. For dozens of Nepalese families, grief is the order of the day. Modern weapons looted in earlier raids propelled this attack by the Maoists. The army has been hit hard, so have the police and civilian security officials. As Parliament in Kathmandu debates the state of emergency in the country, scenes like these may just help politicians put their traditional differences behind them. In the capital, news of the attacks from however far away have reignited the sense of crisis that the authorities hoped had been banished by the state of emergency. Yet the government says it will overcome this setback and press on with its campaign against the Maoists. There's no doubt that the coming days and weeks will be crucial. Daniel Lack, BBC News, Kathmandu. Israeli warplanes have attacked Palestinian security targets in the West Bank. The airstrike is in retaliation for the killing of four Israelis in suicide attacks earlier on Monday. One in Gaza and one a car bomb set off at a police checkpoint on the West Bank that killed a Palestinian driver and an Israeli policeman. This is BBC World, still to come on the programme. Foiled, the police operation that stopped the world's biggest gem heist. Hello, President Bush is in Asia, but at home in the United States, in observance of President's Day, there was a market holiday. With that in mind, here is a recap of where New York's markets uh, ended last week and where we will begin again on Tuesday. Also, the European market action and a look ahead to some important news that will be expected to influence the markets in the week ahead. First, starting with how the markets ended on Friday and how the Tuesday session will begin. This was the scene on Friday, unusual scene on the back of New York Stock Exchange on the day that the Dow closed down and thus will reopen on Tuesday at 99.03. The Nasdaq will reopen on Tuesday at 18.05. Walmart, the biggest retailer in the world, will open its books. The numbers, the latest quarterly numbers of Walmart. In other corporate news as well, Daimler Chrysler, the car giant, will be reporting its earnings. Closely watched, uh, one of those that had to make thousands of job cuts in the previous 12 months. Elsewhere, on the economic front, inflation news will be expected later in the week. The CPI, as well as the survey of leading indicators, and the tug of war will continue between those doubting recovery and those banking on it in 2002. Here's the European markets, a mixed picture, as you can see. From the BBC's business desk in New York on President's Day, that's it for now. This is BBC World. In London, I'm Adrian Finnegan, a reminder of our main headlines. European Union foreign ministers agree to impose sanctions on Zimbabwe. Slobodan Milosevic completes his opening statement at his trial in The Hague. Four men have been found guilty of plotting to steal almost $300 million worth of diamonds from the Millennium Dome in London. Our correspondent George Ekin looks back now at the gem heist that, had it succeeded, would have been the world's biggest ever. This was the glittering prize, the De Beers Millennium Star, a flawless stone of 203 carats, on show with 11 other diamonds, together valued at a minimum of £200 million. 
They were displayed behind armoured glass in a special bomb-proof vault. This police surveillance video shows the gang setting off for the dome in their stolen JCB digger on the morning of the raid. Tipped off by an informer, the flying squad had been watching and filming them for more than five months. It was just after opening time. Five or six hundred staff and visitors were in the dome, another normal day. Except that scores of police, many of them armed, were waiting. Some hidden, some disguised as cleaners, their guns in rubbish bags. Then it all happened. A CCTV camera catches the digger crashing through a perimeter gate before breaching the dome and making straight for the vault. In seconds, William Cockrum and Robert Adams are beside the glass cabinet housing the gems. Cockrum attacks it with a powerful nail gun. Outside, gang leader Raymond Betson revs the digger's engine while Aldo Chirochi hurls smoke grenades. Suddenly, armed police surround them. Operation Magician has started. In the chaos, onlookers are told to keep back. Officers know the two raiders inside the vault are trapped. Adams and Cockrum have penetrated in a few seconds, security designed to hold out for half an hour, but now they're challenged by armed police round the corner and forced to lie down. Escape would have been on this speedboat driven by Kevin Meredith. The Ecstasy Royal had been bought at a marina in Kent by a man signing himself Mr. Diamond. Your speedboat is going also quick now. Follow him. And Kevin Meredith, who claimed he'd been threatened by William Cockrum into driving the boat, was arrested by armed police without a struggle. One of the robbers showed his frustration. We would have got away with this, but for 140 police waiting for us. George Eakin, BBC News, at the Millennium Dome. Police in the American state of Georgia say over 100 bodies have now been found in the grounds of a crematorium. Officials say the final total could top 300. The owner of the crematorium has been charged with taking money by deception for cremations that he never carried out. The number of corpses is still rising. Well over a hundred have been recovered. Many more are believed to be scattered in the woods and crammed into containers. Heavy equipment has been brought into the tri-state crematorium along with police sniffer dogs. Hundreds of emergency workers are now involved in this gruesome operation. At a nearby crisis center, devastating news for the Greer family. They were handed the ashes of Greg Greer one week ago. Today, police confirmed they'd found Greg's body. The ashes were fake. We were still grieving when all this came about. And then they said that the, the ashes inside the container were concrete. concrete bits of concrete. Just chips of concrete. Right next to the Tri-State Crematorium is the Centerpoint Baptist Church. In this tiny place, everybody knew the crematorium's owners, the Marsh family. No one suspected a thing. There was no odd smell, no suspicious activity. They were just, you know, real friendly, outgoing, uh, help anybody sick in the community, visit anybody in the community that was sick. They were just good, good people. But there may be more grisly secrets on the Marsh's property. This lake next to the crematorium is about to be searched by police divers. It'll take weeks to complete the recovery operation and much longer to identify all of the decomposed bodies and allow relatives finally to lay them to rest with dignity. So many sets of ashes will have to be analyzed to see exactly how many families were deceived by the tri-state crematorium. And all the while, pressure is mounting on state officials here to take steps to ensure that this kind of horror never happens again. Stephen Sacker, BBC News, Noble, Georgia. Well, let's go live now to our correspondent, Damien Grammaticus, who's in the town of Noble, where the police have been updating reporters on their investigation. Damien, what uh, have the police been saying? Yeah, well, the latest uh, figures we have is now 139 uh, bodies have been recovered. 
of those, 27 uh, have now been identified, uh, and just a handful, less than 10, have been released back to their families. The first group of bodies returned to their families after being positively identified. Uh, but the search goes on, and it's a huge, huge task. Uh, they're still combing through the buildings, through the vaults, uh, and through the forests as well. Uh, and they say it could take weeks before they know uh, that they finally completed the sweep of the whole area. Uh, and there may be even up to 300 bodies, we're now being told. Do the police have any idea how long this might have been happening, Damien? Well, they say, uh, in answer to that question, between one and two decades, uh, so 10 to 20 years. Some of the oldest remains so far, uh, some of the mummified remains, uh, up to about 15 years old, so uh, a very, very long time back. Uh, uh, and simply many, many questions being asked. How could it have gone on so long? How could nobody have noticed? And even people uh, we've been speaking to here today who came to visit the family here, they never, ever noticed anything. No clues, no hints that this was all going on. It's a small, close-knit community, and people must quite understandably be extremely distressed by what's happened. But are they angry? Yes, I think they are. I think they're also very, very... Uh, let down, I think they feel. These were people who lived in their midst who were a uh, very important part of the local community. Uh, and the pastor at the local church where the family worshipped, he said to me today, he felt like his heart had been ripped out, he said. And, and he simply, he couldn't even bring himself to come here, he said. If the family came to him uh, to seek some solace, then he would give it. For the time being, he said, he was just struggling to understand himself. And I think everybody basically feels that. These were people they knew well. They just don't understand how this happened. Damien, many thanks. Damien Grammaticus in Noble in Georgia. Well, having survived a revolution, two world wars, and uh, five republics, the French franc has finally slipped into history. After a surprisingly swift changeover to the euro, the end of the 640-year-old franc has been greeted with little fuss by the French. Our economics editor, Evan Davis, reports from Nice. The spectacular Nice Carnival was one week late this year, delayed to see out the old currency with comedy, with politics. This is the little euro attacked by the dollar Godzilla, and with panache. Well, we're almost at the end of what seems like an interminable period of euro festivities. They'll have to go back to festivities as normal soon. But away from the parade, how's the euro doing at one of its key objectives? Making Europe one big single market. You know you've got a single market if things cost the same in each country. Does Europe obey this law of one price yet? Not quite. The Leclerc supermarket has branches in different countries and wants pan-European prices, but... Alors, à l'étranger, il est évident que le problème reste différent. The regional manager tells us they can't charge one price till they themselves pay one price. It'll take time. Harmonization is occurring, but in small steps. The Financial Times, for example, now has a one-size-fits-all price for the whole Eurozone. We consider continental Europe as one region, and a lot of the costs we have, let's say editorial costs, uh, are not allocated country by country. So farewell to the franc. Is it hello to a euro area with one single price everywhere? Well, for international goods, things that can be imported and exported, the euro probably will accelerate price convergence, even though there was a lot of that already. But don't overstate it, because for local services like vets, hairdressers and car mechanics, there's no way that'll happen. France, for example, is a rich country, people are paid a lot, and a lot of services will remain relatively expensive with or without the euro. Nice said goodbye to its currency, leading the franc king off for a symbolic burning. That's what they do here. But while the franc has gone, a distinct national economy remains. Evan Davis, BBC News, in Nice. Australia is about to embark upon the biggest ever cull, I'm sorry, there you are, of its national symbol, the kangaroo. The government has given the go-ahead for six million wild kangaroos to be hunted during the coming year. Some conservationists fear the cull is much too large. Our Australia correspondent Michael Peshard reports. It is a sight seen nowhere else on Earth, and they're about to be part of an animal slaughter without parallel too. We spotted these kangaroos in southeast Queensland. Soon after, the government announced it was to increase substantially the annual kangaroo cull. More than six million are due.
be hunted this year. The authorities say they're in almost plague proportions. Some wildlife experts disagree. The federal government is claiming there's 60 million kangaroos in Australia. Well, if there were, they'd be hopping down the street behind us. They're not there. That's a ridiculous figure. Two years ago, they were saying there's 25 million. Now they're saying there's 60 million. It's physically impossible. Ray Cross is a local professional kangaroo shooter. Each night, he shoots as many as he can to supply his pet food business. He's not worried about an overkill. No, I don't think so. Not compared to how many roos are out there. There's more roos than what people claim, that's for sure. That's it. All right, we'll go up there. But this is a debate about more than just numbers. Kangaroo shooting is done in the dead of night, and there are allegations of gross cruelty, of animals being wounded by poorly aimed bullets. The professional shooters reject such claims. Personally, I don't ever see that because it doesn't happen with me, but then again, in some areas it may, but I doubt it. Amateurs, maybe. Professionals, I don't think so. There seems little danger of the whole species becoming endangered as a result of this cull, but there is a more subtle and sinister threat. Shooters sell their meat by the kilo. Inevitably, they shoot the biggest and best specimens. The smallest, weakest animals survive. It is the very opposite of natural selection. Michael Peshard reporting. Before we go, the main news again. EU foreign ministers have decided to impose personal sanctions against President Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe and his senior officials. Well, that's all from the BBC World Newsroom for the moment. Goodbye. BBC World News was brought to you by WLIW New York.